together in his name and by his grace. Welcome this morning. Go ahead and be seated. Good morning, friends. Ooh, good morning. Man, it's good to see everybody today. Wonderful, wonderful, uh, joyous time together both here and for everyone who's joining us online. And today is a special day. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot going on today in our church with the starting of our new series, the launching of our growth groups. And in a little while, we will take some time to remember that this is 9-11. And we want to honor that. We want to remember that. We want to give thanks for the men and women who did so much and lives sacrificed so much to care for others in the midst of tragedy. And so we do want to take time to honor that today. But I will be honest, I have been waiting. I have been waiting all year to preach this series. This is one of those series where I've been waiting a long time. I've never preached through the book of Galatians. I've always wanted to, and so I'm excited about the opportunity to get to do that. The book of Galatians is only six chapters long, but it is a power-packed letter filled with gospel truths and life application and how we do our life with Jesus and what Jesus has done for us. And so yesterday, as I was watching my Texas Longhorns play that team yesterday, (laughs) my good friend Derek, who lives up in Ohio, made a comment that stuck with me after I shared with him that I was going to be starting this new series on Galatians. And this is what Derek said, and I I just wanted to include it in my sermon because it was such a beautiful truth. He said, you know, we're a lot like the Galatians. We are people that when life gets hard, we jump ship. When trouble hits, we find a new team, right? And we do this in all areas of life. He He said, you know, with football, right? Your team does well, you are the biggest fan ever. Where your team does terrible, you are the MIA fan, right? Or you switch teams, right? Or you root against them, right? When work starts to get hard, you quit that job for another job that ends up just being as bad as the job you left. Now, that isn't always the case, okay? But it happens a lot. Marriage hits a rocky place. And what happens too often? We jump ship. We find a new spouse. We get out. Faith starts to push us in places that we don't want to go, right? Deeper into confession. Deeper into service. Deeper into sacrifice. And what do we say? Well, I'll just find a new church. Or I'll find a new God. Listen to these words of St. Paul in Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. Let's look at them together. I am astonished, Paul says. That you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. And watch this. You are turning to a different gospel. Now, in order to unpack and take in what Paul is saying in this verse, we need to do three things this morning together as a church. Number one, we need to answer the question, what is the gospel? Now, I know that may seem a little redundant, but it's actually really important to answer that question. Number two, why would we turn away from the gospel? And then number three, how do we get back to the gospel? So let's pray, and then I'm going to invite you to either open up your notes or open up your Bible. If you're at home, go to go Galatians chapter 1, grab a pen, let's, take some, let's just get into the Word today and let the Word speak to our lives. Let's pray. Father, you, you work through just the most unusual people. You took a man who... <laughs> By, by trade, persecuted and murdered Christians to become the leading church planter in all of, the, all of the, the beginning stages of the life of Christianity. You took his pen and he wrote letters that not only spoke to the issues of the day when these churches were just coming alive, but they also speak 2,000 years later to the issues that the same church The one holy Catholic church suffers and deals with. So today, may your words speak to our lives. In your name we pray and we all said together, church, amen, amen, amen. Let's go to Galatians 1, beginning at verse 1. Let's look at it together, church. Paul, right? Paul, an apostle, not from men or through man, 
but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, the same God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. This letter is written by Paul. And Paul is an apostle, right? I'm going to circle that word. Go ahead. He's an apostle. An apostle is one who is sent with a mission and authority. That's how you know what an apostle is, right? He is sent by God on a mission with an authority. And Paul's special calling on life, look what he says there in verse 1. He says, I didn't get it from men, and I didn't get it through men. What does he mean by that? He means, listen, Peter didn't come up to me and says, Paul, I want you to be an apostle. Matthew didn't come up to me and say that. Luke didn't come up to me and say that. Nobody from the church came up and said that. No, you'll go to Acts chapter 9, and what you find is that Jesus is the one who said it. Jesus is the one who called him. It comes directly from the resurrected Jesus. And he's very intentional here. Watch the intentionality. He's very intentional to, to at the beginning, assert the fact that I am an apostle. And if you're going to listen to somebody, don't listen to some yahoos or who are coming and trying to mess everything up in your life. Listen to the one that God has sent. Right? Paul's mission is to take the message of Jesus to the Gentile people and raise up local church leaders while planting churches. And so in the book of Acts, right, we see that Paul goes on three missionary journeys, right? And he's going to spread the gospel, he's going to raise up leaders, and he's going to plant churches, all right? So I want to put a map up for you, and I want you to be able to see. It's also in your notes, but I want to put a map up on the screen so as I walk through this, you can kind of see the progression, right? On Paul's first missionary journey, he's going to leave his home base of Antioch. He's going to take a ship to the island of Cyprus, and then he's going to come up through a place called Perga, and then he's going to make his way backwards, kind of back uh, to, the, to the east, to what's known as the region of Galatia. And in Galatia are two prominent cities, Lystra and Derbe. And here Paul is going to go, and he's going to preach the gospel, he's going to raise up church leaders, and he's going to plant churches. Now, this area of Galatia is what we know as Turkey. This is right in central Turkey today. And Paul and his partner Barnabas came to this region around 46, 47 A.D., around 16 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you want to read this story, you just go to Acts chapter 13 and 14, and you can really read the full story of what it was like for Paul to go to these cities. And so Paul plants these churches, and then you can kind of see it. He goes backwards. He, goes, he kind of reverses direction, and he's going to go all the way back to Antioch. And they kind of figured that it takes between six months to a year for Paul, after he leads Galatia, to get himself back to Antioch, which is his home base. But when he gets home, word is that there's trouble in Galatia. It says that the church, Paul receives word that the church in Galatia is in wreck, is wrecked, and they are deserting the gospel. So let's pick up in verse 3. Before Paul addresses the problem, he first gives them a warm greeting. He blesses them. Watch this, verse 3. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself up for our sins. Why? To deliver me and you from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is a standard greeting, right? And Paul is setting the tone for his entire level, letter by extending them grace and peace. Have you noticed that no matter where you go in this Christian life, you need grace and peace? Amen? Come on now, y'all with me? Everybody needs grace and peace, right? I mean, who doesn't need grace? Who doesn't need God to show you kindness when you least deserve it? Amen. Who doesn't need peace in their life from God? A wholeness of 
from God that brings spiritual and emotional and relational and physical healing. We all need grace and peace in our life. These are incredible gifts to us given by Jesus, the one who gave himself up for our sins. And in this greeting, Paul is setting the foundation of the gospel, which we're going to unpack in a moment. But imagine for just a moment. Everybody imagine with me for a moment. Okay? If you're online with us today, imagine for me just a moment. Imagine it's Sunday morning, but it's not 2022 in Gardendale, Alabama. Instead, you are living in the Middle East. You're living in Turkey. It's 2,000 years ago. and You're showing up for your house church on Sunday morning to celebrate the Lord's Day and the resurrection of Christ. But word has gotten out that the church has received a very special letter from Paul. He's back in his hometown, but he sent a letter to be read to all the churches. And so you show up in your house church in Derby, or you show up in your house church in Lystra, and you're excited to hear what's Paul got to say. And he starts off with verses 1 through 4, right? And everything sounds great. To him be the glory forever and ever. And all the congregations of Lystra and Derby said, Amen! And then you get to verse 6. Whoa. Bam! Everything's good. Then you get to verse 6. Look what happens. He says, verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting Jesus who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there's really another gospel anyway, but there are some who are troubling you and they want to distort the gospel of Christ. Talk about a two-by-four on Sunday. That'll wake you up. Can you imagine sitting in church, hearing those words for the very first time? What do you mean we've deserted Jesus? What do you mean we've turned to a different gospel? What do you mean that we've distorted the gospel? Can you imagine that letter was written to us today? Or better yet, what if that letter was written to the church of the U.S.? What would it say? Church, you've abandoned the gospel. That'd get our attention. You know, yesterday watching my Texas Longhorns was a lot of fun. It was, until the moment we lost. But I have to admit, there was a play in the end zone, and this is the picture of it, right? There's this play in the end zone. It has to be the wackiest most ridiculous moment in football I've ever seen. And I've been watching football for a long time. Alabama's on offense. Texas is on defense. Texas has Alabama backed up in their end zone, which is not good for Alabama. If, you are, if, you, if you're not a football person, let me just say, this is not good, okay? The play is run. Texas defense goes after the quarterback. He's falling all over the place. Somebody's grabbed him by the leg. He falls down. Should be two points for us. Bitch, why? But, but, but why? But, 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 sorry. <laughs> Got a little excited there. <laughs> Excuse me. Which, by the way, we only lost by one. Come on now. So they review it. They change their mind. They call something else. They say we didn't mean to call that in the first place. So not only does Texas not get the ball and the two points, which would have won the game, but Alabama keeps the ball and ultimately wins the game. And everybody on the field, everybody in the TV booths, fans on social media, I got people texting me, what just happened? <laughs> can someone explain to me what's going on? I can only imagine that the members of the Galatia church had the same feeling. When Paul says, you've distorted the gospel. You deserted the gospel. You have abandoned Jesus. What's going on? And the only way to know what's going on in that football game is to have somebody clarify the rules. And the only way to know what's going on in the church is for God to clarify the gospel. So let's look at it together. What is the gospel? 
From the very get-go, Paul gives us a clear picture of what the gospel is. Go back to chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. You see the gospel unfolded here, right? Grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's this gospel moment, right? Who gave himself up for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gospel is just loaded in these sentences. And so let me sum it up for you, though. I want to give you one clear sentence that defines the gospel this morning. And here it is. I'm going to read it, and then we'll read it together, right? The gospel is this. God's divine plan to rescue his children from this evil age. Can we all read that together? One, two, three. God's divine plan to rescue his children from this evil age. The gospel is God's divine plan to rescue his children from this evil age. Let me break that down for you. First part, God's divine plan. I'm going to put an image on the screen for you. Look at this with me. God has a plan. That plan began at creation when God made the world and everything was good. But at the fall, when sin came into the world, it disrupted, distorted, and destroyed everything the good that God was creating. And so God had a plan. I'm going to, I'm going to, I got a plan, right? I'm going to rescue my children from this fallen, evil world, this age. And so in that plan, right, he, 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 he says, I'm going to give the world Jesus. He's going to call a people to them. Throughout the Old Testament, he's going to show them the folly of human effort and the depravity of sin. He's going to show them that, listen, you cannot rule yourselves, you cannot lead yourselves, you cannot save yourselves by the law. And therefore, he sent the world a Savior, his one and only Son, Jesus, who established the church to spread the gospel to everyone. And then he will return. To live with his people forever. He redeems us on the cross to bring about our total restoration. God has a plan. And his plan is about rescuing his children. Number two. God's plan is to rescue his children. He says it. He says, I gave you Jesus to deliver you, which means to rescue from your sins. God loves this world and he loves you and he loves me because we are his children. And so the father gave the world Jesus. And Jesus who is the God man through his life and death and resurrection brings about a new life for me and for you. I love this piece of art. And I'm going to put it on the screen for you can see. I know it's, it's small so you can't see all the panels and I'll try to send this to you at home so you can see this right. But every panel walks you from beginning to end of the life of Jesus, lived for you so that Jesus could fulfill the law on your behalf, then his death for you so that sacrifice may be made for your sins, and then the resurrection of Christ for you so that in the waters of baptism you may live again. Jesus, God has a plan, and his plan is simple, to rescue his children from this present evil age. Number three, God has a plan to rescue his children from this evil age. We have known this from the beginning of time, that there are three mortal enemies to all of us. They're very simple, right? If you know them, you can say them with me. Sin, death, and the devil. Sin, your flesh, the temptations to do what is wrong and evil and against the will of God. Death, the curse that all of us live under. Devil, the active agent working to deceive you and pull you away by any means necessary, including false gospels, working against your life. And these three great enemies were conquered by Jesus on the cross. And so we have the gospel. What is it? 
As you read the book of Galatians over the next few weeks, both in church, and I encourage you to read it on your own. Keep this in mind. The book of Galatians is about God's divine plan to rescue his children from this evil age. And this message is so good, and it is so great, and this message has changed my life. Why would anyone want to turn from it? That's a question I ask a lot. I'll be honest with you. I ask this question a lot. See, I have people in my life, very close to me, who I care about, who I love, who have walked away from Jesus. They've turned their backs on the church. They've turned their backs on the message of the gospel. And in their words, they want nothing to do with God. And it's very real. And it breaks my heart. And I don't know about you. I don't, I don't know where you're at, right? But I hope it does the same for you. If you have people in your life who are walking away from Jesus, who are walking away from the church, who are walking away from the message of the gospel, it should break your heart. And it should cause great sorrow. And there should be something inside of you that feels pain over it. And it's sadness. And that's why this message of Galatians is so important. Let's go back to verse 6 for a moment. Here's what he says. He says, listen, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ, and now you are turning to a different gospel. <laughs> and if you didn't know it, there's not really another gospel, but you're turning to it. Paul's frustration, maybe even Paul's hurt in the moment, is very evident. He says, I'm astonished, I'm taken back that you are so quickly, less than a year, deserting Jesus. And that word deserting is a Greek word that means to switch allegiances. You've switched teams. You're now on a different team. You were once on team Jesus and now you're not. We need to recognize that Paul is speaking to two groups of people here. He's speaking about those on the left who have deserted Jesus and then those on the right who are causing the desertion. For those deserting the gospel, Paul says, look, you've turned, right? Like, like you're going the wrong direction, right? I was watching my daughter's very first soccer game on Saturday. And every once in a while, when you're watching three and four and five-year-olds play soccer, you know what happens? They get turned the wrong way. And so they score in the other team's goal. It's, it's quite fun. We all clap, you know. They're just three and four and five, right? It's fun to watch, right? But this is what Jesus is saying. Like, listen, you're supposed to be going that way, and you've turned to something else, and you're going a different way now. You've turned your back on Jesus. You've turned your back on the gospel, right? What you're saying is Jesus isn't enough. There's got to be something more. And the sad part is, as I look at America today, and I look at the world today, and I look at the church today, we have done this. We have done, I'm not saying we as a good shepherd have done this, but there's always the temptation for us to do this. But the church in general has done this. And so I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you three gospels. Actually, I'm going to give you four. I'll give you a bonus one. It's not in your notes, right? I'm going to give you four this morning. These are four substitute gospels that people in our world are buying into all over the place. Number one, the prosperity gospel. Okay? The prosperity gospel. Number two, the social gospel. The social gospel. Number three, the nationalistic or political gospel. And the number four, this is the bonus one. God just kind of really put this on my heart this morning. The narcissistic gospel. The narcissistic gospel. Okay, so let, let, me, let me walk you through this just really quick. Okay, number one, prosperity. Prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel says this. I love Jesus, and what I'm adding to it is this. Money, health, and success. That to be a follower of Christ, the gospel, the new gospel, the false gospel means that money, health, and its success accompany me. That this is God's divine plan. That everyone should be blessed this way. 
And so you hear it preached, you hear it taught, you hear, you hear it all the time. God wants you to get yours. This is a false gospel because it removes the realm of suffering and poverty and, and, and dependency on Christ. Does that mean, though, that God isn't going to honor and bless people? No, but it's not a part of the gospel. It's not a part of, a, it's, not, it's not a promise that is guaranteed with the gospel. Number two, what we call the social gospel, right? The social gospel is, 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 is the gospel that's tied up with liberation and power and social status and justice. And justice is a good thing when it's done right. Reconciliation is a good thing when it's done right. But when the gospel is perverted, right, to, to now create a, a, a class system, to create a system where rather than now we are all equal in Christ, right, rather than we are all one in Christ, rather than we are all uh, united and reconciled in Christ, there's still division. There's still power struggles. There's still things that are going around. Uh, uh, like, like if you got power but you don't, then you're going to get power so you don't have it, right? It's just a flip-flopping of things. And this is what the social gospel does. Number three. The nationalistic or political gospel. This is where we take Jesus, and now we're looking for a political savior to accompany Jesus. We want God's favor to be upon not the church, but the nation. We want to look to political figures to make things happen that Jesus says the church is responsible for. It ties politics and religion in an unhealthy marriage that should never exist. Number four, the narcissistic gospel. Now this one I think is, this is the one that God hit me with this morning. The narcissistic gospel is about Jesus and me. And so that your faith becomes all about you. Let me say that again. Your faith becomes all about me and Jesus. Doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. It's just me and Jesus. So you can have me and Jesus church. And you can have me and Jesus communion. And you can have me and Jesus quiet time. And you can have me and Jesus just do this. And I don't need the church. And I don't need people. And I don't need community. And I don't need to be um, in, a, in a place where I'm learning together with other Christians and serving together with other Christians. It's just, it's a very American way of looking at it. It's just about me and Jesus. And it even, it even translates when you come up here to communion. Because and this is why we do communion the way we do, right? Because this is not about just your time with Jesus. It's also your time with your brothers and sisters in Christ who you're kneeling by and you're joining with, in with and under the bread and wine of Christ. So these four Gospels are false distortions of the message of Jesus. And any time we add something to the Gospel... We are distorting the gospel. Look what he says here. Let's continue on, verse 7. But there are some who trouble you, and they want to distort the gospel of Christ. And why do they do that? Right? But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. See, what happened in Galatia was that after Paul left, there was a group of Jewish Christians called Judaizers. And they came in and they started teaching a distorted gospel. They wanted the Galatians to embrace a Jewish way of life. Jesus plus circumcision. Jesus plus kosher laws. Jesus plus the old covenant laws. Jesus plus you fill in the blank. And Paul's words for these men who were coming in and causing this distortion, right, causing this desertion is harsh. He says, listen, if anyone, including me, including angels in heavens, lead you to a different gospel, look what he says. He says, let them be accursed. Let them be damned. So what do you do? What do you do when you discovered 
It's you've added something to the gospel. See, the problem with the Galatians is they were listening to the wrong people. Let me just say this, church. There's so much noise in the world. Don't ever be fooled that you could be listening to the wrong person. And that person is distorting the gospel in your life. That's why you test everything I ever say up here so that I don't distort the gospel. It's why you test everything in our growth groups so that we don't distort the gospel. It's why when you're listening to things on television or you're reading a book or you're listening to a podcast or you're listening to another preacher or you're listening to some music, you've got to test it so that you're not being distorted. Just because it wears the label of Christian doesn't mean it's good. There's a lot of junk out there and a lot of things that distort the gospel message of Jesus. So what do you do? What do you do when you found, huh, I have added something to the mix? What if you said, if, God, the, if the gospel is God's divine plan to rescue his children from this evil age, and you added the word and, or but, well, yeah, but, yeah, and, but there's got to be more. And you find yourself going, Jesus plus, you fill in the blank. How do we get back to the gospel? Because how we get back to the gospel is how we help others get back to the gospel. How can we get back to the gospel? You know, when Martin Luther realized that the gospel had been distorted and the church had been desecrated and the gospel had been deserted, he wrote his 95 theses and he pinned them on the door at the church of Wittenberg and he said, we need to talk about how to get back to the gospel. And I think we need to do the same thing. So let me just give you three things just to close with. If you find yourself away from this gospel, you've added something to the gospel, you've bought into a false gospel, whether it's an individual, whether it's a narcissistic gospel, whether it's a social gospel, whether it's a political gospel, or whether it's a, a, a prosperity gospel, consumer gospel, right? Here's what I want to invite you to do. Number one, confess the distortion. Just acknowledge it. Recognize it. Ask God to show you if you have bought in to a false gospel narrative. Number two, once you confess that, then repent of it. Say, God, I need you to change my heart and change my mind because I have bought into the wrong illusion of the gospel. I have taken the gospel and I've added stuff to it. I've taken the gospel and I've distorted it. I've taken the gospel and kind of set it aside for a false hope and a false well-being, whatever it may be. And the way you get back to the gospel then is to receive the gospel. This is what we do as Christians. It's what we do every week. It's what we do all the time. We receive the gospel of Jesus, God's divine plan to rescue sinners from this present evil age. So the way back to the gospel is to receive the good news that Jesus Christ loves and forgives you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray. Father, this day and every day, help us to never lose sight of the gospel. And when things creep into our lives that are false gospels, whether it be the me and Jesus syndrome, whether it be the social justice warrior syndrome, whether it be the political nationalistic raise, you know, my hand, you know, uh, Jesus, whether it be a consumer-driven Jesus, a prosperity Jesus, it's all about getting mine. Whatever distorted message of the gospel that we have embraced, Help us to lay it aside, repent of it, and instead embrace the true gospel, the plan of God to rescue sinners from this present evil age. And as we stand merciful, we stand graciously under the cross as baptized believers. 
In his name we pray, and we all say together, amen, amen. Let's stand.